absolute honor to introduce Vice Admiral Nora Tyson. Angela's got a few inches on me. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I, I, can't, I can't express um, very well the thrill that Wayne, my husband Wayne over here, um, that we have had being a part of this this week. Mark, this is incredible. You got a great group, and to be a part of this, Nancy, Ed, you know, I feel like we're we're friends for life. Um, okay, I was hoping not to use my glasses, but I will. <laughs> um, so it uh, it really is. It's an incredible honor to be here with all of the accomplished women and men in this room and, and fortunately we've been to Portland a few times and had some experiences with Cambia and, and you've, you guys are incredible. This is an incredible community. Um, so a big thank you to Mark Gans and Leslie uh, and the Cambia team for putting this on and letting us, the group that's gonna share with you today, share some thoughts and share some of our experiences. Now, some of you have heard my story, and I'm sorry, but you're probably gonna hear a little bit of it again. But some of you are probably wondering how it is that I found myself here amongst this distinguished group. So I'll give you a quick synopsis, and then I'm gonna move on to the meat and potatoes and talk a little bit about leadership and, and my thoughts and experiences. And then hopefully we're gonna have time for some questions. And uh, it should be a walk in the park after playing golf with Nancy Lopez, <laughs> Julie Inkster, and Karen Stupples, and demonstrating very proficiently to Brittany Lang my lack of ability to get out of a sand trap. So first of all, as you heard, I retired from the Navy a little over 38 years ago, uh, last September. My last job on active duty, I was the Third Fleet Commander out of San Diego. Now, Third Fleet is comprised of all of the Naval forces in the Western United States, West Coast, out to the International Dateline, except our ballistic missile submarines who belong to the Strategic Command in Omaha, Nebraska. So Third Fleet's made up of about 110 ships, about 400 aircraft, about 30 submarines, five carrier strike groups, an amphibious strike group, all in about 60,000 people. So it, it was an incredible job, it was a demanding job, but it was a lot of fun. So part of our responsibility at Third Fleet was running the fleet weeks on the West Coast, bringing our men and women and their hardware, uh, their ships, their submarines, their aircraft, their stuff, along with our Marine, Canadian, and Coast Guard brethren uh, and their hardware to Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA, and San Diego. So during my several trips to Portland for Fleet Week slash uh, the Rose Festival, I met and I got to know um, a lot of the, the leadership at Cambia. And they are, again, thank you, Mark, tremendous supporters of Fleet Week and our men and women in uniform. So I wanna say thank you to Cambia, again, for your great support of our men and women in uniform and, very importantly, their families. As we all know, we couldn't do what we do, no matter what it is that we do, without the support of our families. 
especially in the military as we deploy to the other side of the world, in many cases in harm's way. It makes it a lot easier for us to do our jobs and, and keeps our mind at ease and our minds on our job, which is very important, knowing that our families are taken care of back home. So again, thank you, Mark, for what you guys do. So that's my connection to Cambia. That's my connection to Portland and how Wayne and I were so fortunate uh, to be a part of this week's events. So the next question, how did I end up in the Navy? So again, for those of you who know this story, um, I'm sorry. And that's a little longer story, but I'm going to try to summarize it quickly and again. So if you've got questions, if I leave something out. I spent my formative years in Memphis, Tennessee, a fairly typical childhood, went to the neighborhood elementary school, uh, went to uh, a all-girls high school, and had a lot of fun along the way. I haven't mentioned the Navy yet, have I? <laughs> I had great parents. I had wonderful parents who put a good education as the number one priority for my brother and for me. And they instilled good values in us, and they led us to believe we could do anything we set our minds to. I went on to Vanderbilt University in Nashville and was an English major after thinking I was going to be a doctor, a brain surgeon, a marine biologist, um, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and I took the law school admissions test. I, I did okay on the test and thought I'd probably go to law school. Um, so again, I feel very fortunate to have had parents who didn't try to push me down a certain path. And they were very patient while I tried to find myself and they were very proud when ultimately I announced I was going to join the Navy. So after graduation from Vanderbilt, I returned home. A few weeks later, I got a call from a recruiter that said, hey, we got your name and number. Why don't you come down here and chat with us? And I said, you're who and you what? <laughs> and, uh, and so to put this in context, this was 1979, post-Vietnam, Jimmy Carter, uh, the military was not the most popular occupation. And in fact, in, in D.C., this is no lie, we were not wearing uniforms in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I left out, needless to say, it was a very male-dominated occupation. So anyway, I had nothing better to do that day, so I said, okay, why not? I'll, I'll go talk to these guys. You never know. So off I go, they gave me an aptitude test. They said, hey, you did pretty well. You can go into this or you can go into that. And I said, uh, they never, never mentioned ships. They never mentioned airplanes, so remember that. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So they said, well, we'll just put you down for general unrestricted line, which is kind of the catch-all. And I said, hey, you know, very respectfully, you can put me down for whatever you want to, because I ain't signed anything. <laughs> and, and one thing led to another, and they said, well, let's just do this physical thing, and let's just do this, and let's just do that. And I just said, yeah, okay, whatever. So about three weeks later, I got a phone call, and they said, hey, you got accepted. And I said, great. You know, did I, didn't I win a cubie doll or what? And they said, you got accepted to officer candidate school. And I go, oh. And I said, uh, is that a good thing? <laughs> and they're like, oh, you know, it's an honor. This is great. Weren't you waiting for our call? And I said, no, not exactly. <laughs> and they said, well, oh, yeah, it's an honor. And, you know, you're special. Oh, yeah, okay. So ultimately, uh, I thought about it and make a lo much, much longer story, a little bit shorter. Uh, I thought, you know, if I don't, I'll always wonder what would happen if I had and what's four years. And that was what the commitment was at the time. So off I went to officer candidate school and to the Navy. So at OCS, we learned navigation, we learned marine engineering. We learned how to march. We learned how to make our beds and wear uniforms. Um, and a few other things that I had had no exposure to whatsoever while I was growing up. So then I was commissioned as an ensign in the United States Navy three months later. Uh, a door had opened, one that I had not considered at all. 
And I took a deep breath and I walked through that door into a world that was previously unknown to me. And it, it turned out, as I said on the video, it turned out to be a, a wonderful journey, a very rewarding career, and an extraordinary life. At the time of my commissioning, as I said, not many occupations were open to women in the Navy, or the entire military for that matter. How, how many, I know Catherine, any, anybody that's been, thank you, thank you for your service, I appreciate it. You guys kind of get what I'm talking about. Um, so I wasn't really sure what career path I wanted to follow, so I ended up in Washington, D.C., because I had a bunch of college roommates there, and I said, okay, well, we'll just go continue college and I'll wear a uniform. Um, so I was in an administrative job and I found out very quickly that that was not my calling in life. So I worked for a couple of senior male aviators who said, and they, they figured it out and they said, you won't stay in the Navy if you stay in this line of work. You need to apply for flight school. And I go, oh, okay, sure. So I did, I got accepted to flight school, um, and that started a career in naval aviation, and there was no turning back. And that decision opened up tremendous opportunity, you know, then obviously going into aviation, but later uh, it opened up even more. Things that I never dreamed of because those opportunities had not existed when I joined the Navy. So it turns out that I had some amazing experiences. I was thrilled with the level of responsibility I was given as a very junior officer, which is what you do in the, in the military. And experience that my high school and college buddies to this day just kind of marvel at. So over the years, I kept making the most of whatever opportunities presented themselves, and the Navy found new and challenging jobs for me. The laws and the policies changed over time, and I was fortunate enough to have command of an aviation squadron, an amphibious assault ship. I served with some incredible leaders, and I got promoted to Admiral, which for someone who never thought she'd be in the Navy and never dreamed she'd be even a lieutenant commander, that was, that was pretty amazing stuff. And I, and I found out I loved what I did. And that's important for a leader, that, you, that those you lead clearly see that you love what you do. You're setting the example for those that are coming behind you. If you love what you do and you strive to be the best at what you do and you pass that along to those coming behind you, you are helping to make the world a better place and giving those that are coming behind you the tools that they need to succeed. And that's an incredible legacy. So somehow over the years, I kept doing well. I kept studying. I was open to, I was excited about new experiences that would shape me as an officer, would shape me as a person, would shape me as a leader. And I listened. I listened to those around me. I listened to my subordinates. I listened to my superiors. And the Navy continued to offer me new and challenging jobs. So just like many of you, I found success by being humble and accepting challenges, sometimes turning adversity into opportunity, by staying smart on my craft, and by truly valuing the contributions of every sailor, soldier, airman, Marine, Coast Guardsman, and civilian that work for me at any time. I learned when to lead from the front and when to step back and look at the bigger picture and let others step up and take the lead. And I gotta say, experience is one of the best contributions to being a good leader because you understand what people are going through. So I have a lot of people ask me how proud I am to be the first woman to command an aircraft carrier strike group, the first woman to command our task force in Singapore, the first woman to command the largest maritime exercise in the world, the first woman to command a numbered fleet, 
And, and I, gotta, I gotta be honest with you, many times in my career, I looked around the room and I found that I was the only woman there. And many of those times I was a senior person or I was a commander. But I learned early on, and I, I really got to go back to officer candidate school, that it, it wasn't about gender. And in fact, most of my career, I don't think I even thought about it. It was about the mission. It was about getting the job done. It was about solving whatever problem we might be faced with. So I, I'm I, I am very proud of all those firsts, but I'm even more proud and excited that that's behind us. Someone had to be the first, and I feel very fortunate, extraordinarily fortunate, that the laws changed and the policies changed when they did, and I was in the right place and the right time, and I tried my best at whatever job I was given, and tried my best to help the greater team to succeed in every endeavor. So I was, I was sitting on the bench, and I had this experience to do the job, and to a point where I couldn't because the laws prohibited it, but then when they changed, and I was on the bench, and the coach put me in the game, it, it, was, it was incredible. And it was about timing and taking advantage of opportunity. So I know this room is filled with leaders from every walk of life, from business, civic, sports, military, government, you name it. And I'd love to meet every one of you and hear your stories. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about why we are all here and why we do what we do. And I like to think that all of our motivations are uh, very similar. And I'll, I'll qualify what I'm saying today. This is my experience totally. This is my thoughts totally. I don't have a U.S. Navy, U.S. government stamp on my head. Um, I have been brainwashed a couple of times, but that's... <laughs> um, and so th this is what's been developing my, in my head from values that my parents gave me, school, the military. So I'll get, I'll get to more of my story in a minute, but I, I want to preface that with some of my thoughts about why we serve, why we serve our nation, why we serve our families, uh, why we serve our friends, and ultimately why we serve ourselves. So why do we serve and how do we serve? As I matured in my career in the United States Navy, I came to feel very strongly about my service to my country and my fellow man and thus to my family. Personally, I don't think there is a, pre a profession that could be more rewarding and fulfilling than serving your country and your fellow man. In the United States military, as some of you know, we take an oath when we enlist or when we're commissioned as an officer and we renew that oath each time we re-enlist or we get promoted. And we take an oath, and our, our lawmakers take this same oath, a similar oath, to support and defend our Constitution, which is the foundation of our nation written very thoughtfully by our founding fathers 231 years ago. Declaration of Independence was in 1776. Constitution came a little later. That oath is not gender or race or ethnic, ethnicity specific. We all support and defend the same constitution and the same nation. We all enjoy the same freedoms that our forefathers fought for and that we so passionately want to preserve for our children and our children's children. And we know in today's world that we need our friends and our allies around the world who share similar values at our side to make the world a better place for future generations. Now, I fancy myself to be a golfer, and some of you, Nancy, <laughs> may get a real kick out of that. And I should say, <laughs> I aspire to be a golfer, or I can dress like a golfer. And in golf, as in life, we say, 
start with the end in mind. So for you golfers out there, you know that means you need to follow through, which Nancy told me yesterday, by the way. <laughs> the question that begs in life is, what do you want to do with your life? And we don't always know, but should never unintentionally or intentionally shut the door on any opportunity. We just never know where walking through that door is going to lead and what road you're going to be walking down. Where that follow through is going to lead you. We all reach decision points in our lives where we may be faced with non-traditional options or opportunities. Some that may be going against our cultural norms or perceived cultural norms. So that was the case for me when I walked through that door when I came in the Navy in 1979. There were not many options for women. The Navy and the military were just not viable options that many women considered. So fast forward to the present and we are getting a heck of a lot closer in the United States and I would venture to say around the world at, at different paces to a point where anyone can do anything they set their mind to if they are physically, mentally, and emotionally capable. Now that, that is an incredibly important point. Whether you're a leader in the military at any level or a brain surgeon or a golfer or a, a, a whatever you are, if an individual is not capable of doing a specific job for any reason and could put lives, including their own, and missions at risk, then in my mind there's no question about it. He or she should not be in that position if, if they're not capable of doing the job. For example, I should not be a brain surgeon. I should not be a pro golfer. <laughs> I just don't have the capability. And could I learn? Maybe, but it is doubtful at this time in my life. <laughs> Highly questionable. So leadership in a changing world. And I, I think that was the topic of my conversation. Holy cow. I mean, the world is constantly changing. And in some respects, today, the world is changing exponentially. Whether it's technology or the diversity of workforces, multi-generational, multicultural, gender diverse, you name it. Leaders have to accept change, which is, which is hard. It's hard for people in general to accept change. You have to embrace innovation. If you want to be the best whatever it is, you have to flow with the times or you're going to flat get run over. So, however, some of the most important tenets of successful leadership will always stay the same. They just may become more challenging. And I'll talk more about the importance of communicating as an example, but the advent of email, texting, telecommuting, video conference calls, all of that stuff, it makes it so much more difficult to build personal relationships. And I would say trust. Trust and respect are critical to a well-functioning team. You just need to be more creative and more persistent in building that trust and that respect through meaningful communication however you can do it. So I was asked to speak about my journey that led me to a career in the United States Navy, why I stayed in for over 38 years, and what I learned during those 38 years, my thoughts on leadership and specifically on women's leadership. So I had to think really hard about what leadership really is. And I think we all agree there's no one size fits all but there are traits that define good, if not great, leaders. For example, I'm sure someone in this room has been bold enough to have a vision, but also humble enough to recognize that achieving it takes patience and the efforts of many people. 
Someone in this room has had the humility to put their teammates, their employees, or their constituents first, rather than themselves and their own personal goals, simply because it was the right thing to do. Someone in this room has shown the integrity to do the right thing, even when it wasn't the popular choice, and has inspired others to be better people by doing that. Someone in this room has dedicated their time to study and hone their skills in their craft so they can speak intelligently and identify with those working alongside them, contributing more to the team. Someone in this room has known when to be out in front guiding the team during the journey and when to step back and let others take the reins. And I'm guessing the truth is many of you have done most of these things. You wouldn't be where you are today or have aspirations to climb even higher if you define leadership as just the ability to lead other people or the privilege of having the biggest office and all the other stuff that goes with being a senior leader. I believe the key to being a successful leader is understanding two things. One is you, or me, depending on your perspective, and the other is the team. So let's start with you. If you don't have the you or the me part right, it will be hard to lead others. I've learned through personal experience and through observation of others that you must be true to yourself and not try to be something that you're not. And, and particular, particularly, yes, I was an English major. Particular, I have trouble with those bigger than three syllable words. Particularly many women. And, and again, this is my observation. They feel that they must be more masculine, less emotional, less empathetic to succeed and to compete with their male counterparts. Particularly, there's another one, particularly in a historically male-dominated profession. Now, I totally disagree. One, it's hard to continually put on a show and be effective in whatever it is you're trying to do. And two, I found that being myself and being emotional and being empathetic and natural is appreciated and often most often, most of the time, admired by the team and certainly makes it easier to concentrate on the job at hand without having to keep up pretensions and be somebody that you're not. It's about transparency, it's about sincerity, and it's about honesty, which I think everybody will agree are pretty important traits for a leader. So remember your roots and who helped you succeed. Thank those who helped you along the way, and every day seek to give others what those individuals gave to you. Be passionate about what you do. Love what you do. If you don't, put out a good shot. No. <laughs> if you don't, no kidding, because, uh, you know, you graduate from college, I mean, like me, you fall into something and you go, yeah, I don't think so. But whatever it is, be the best, or try to be the best at whatever it is. If you're, you know, washing dishes, be the best daggum dishwasher, whatever it is, and then figure out what that passion is and go for it. Life is too short, and I tell you, since I retired, life's going even faster, it's frightening. But life is too short not to. Uh, many people are successful because they are passionate about what they do and they're determined to succeed. Whether it's in sports or your career choice or being a parent, passion is infectious. If it's apparent that you love what you do, those around you will feel that passion and they're going to want to be on your team. Again, strive to be the best at what you do, whether it's as a student, a gardener, a brain surgeon, a golfer, a team member, a CEO. Educate yourself, hone your skills, be your best. Doors will open for you. 
while striving to be yourself, be humble. It's not all about you. It's about the team. And I'm going to talk about the team in a second. It's about giving those coming behind you what they need to succeed personally and professionally. They are our future. Our job, and ultimately their job, is to make the, better, the world a better place for our children and our children's children. So now I said we're going to talk about the team. We're going to talk about the team. In most things that you do in life, you're a part of a team. Whether it's a sports team, a project team, a family, a church congregation, a board of directors, you name it. This is where mutual respect and diversity come into the discussion. Leadership is about solving problems and making a difference. It's about opening those doors of opportunity for those that you lead and helping them reach their potential. It's about communicating and collaborating to solve those problems. It's about listening to others and valuing their input and caring about them and respecting them as people, as individuals. It's about putting yourself in other shoes and looking at things through their perspective. And that's how I found you build a cohesive functional team that can solve the most complex problems. That leads to the discussion of diversity, and I'm glad to hear you guys talk about diversity. And congratulations, Mark, on what you guys have done in the, in the field of diversity. But I'll tell you my thoughts. In, in today's world, as I said, we have much more diversity in the workforce, in academia, in society than we did when I was growing up, unquestionably. That introduces new challenges, but more than that, it makes us a better organization. It makes us a better team. If we have gender diversity, ethnic diversity, multi-generational diversity, political diversity, cultural diversity, diversity of experience, and education, and diversity of thought. Now, for many years in our military, and I, I hope some of you will back me up, diversity, I think, was somewhat of a buzzword. Our leadership was expected to have a diverse staff. But in my opinion, that was, um, yeah, sometimes it was superficial, and it was diversity for diversity's sake. Diversity is critical in every organization and at every level. And it isn't just gender or ethnic diversity. It is that diversity of thought. It's the diversity of opinion and perspectives, diversity in how we look at those problems that we need to solve. And once we have a diverse team, that's great, but it's imperative that we respect that diversity and genuinely listen and learn from others on the team. People want to be appreciated. They want to be listened to. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Know your people. Appreciate their diversity. Know what they contribute to the team. Know their families care about them as people. I found that communication and transparency are critical. You've probably heard the saying that you can't communicate enough. And I, I honestly think that's true anywhere. Whether you're in a combat situation, a training situation, an office setting on the playing field, or, or you're at home with your family. The team needs to understand the vision, the mission why we are all here. They want to buy into that something that's bigger than themselves, to be a part of a true team. But they need the leader to communicate that purpose, that vision, and what the plan is. So back when I'm telling sea stories now for the you Navy, you Swabies out there. Back when I was the commanding officer of USS Bataan, which is one of our amphibious assault ships, we were going through some pretty hectic times. We were called on short notice to deploy to the Persian Gulf for Operation Iraqi Freedom One. If you recall, that's when we, uh, we our forces and our, our friends and allies went into Kuwait after the Iraqi forces and invaded Kuwait and we pushed them back into Iraq. When we deployed from Norfolk, we had no idea 
what the outcome might be or even what we would be doing and certainly we had no idea how long we would be gone. We ended up spending 145 days straight at sea without a port call. We did have showers, we did have food. But the 1,900 Marines we'd taken with us and put ashore and supported them, flying Harriers, and those are our vertical takeoff and landing jump jets. Um, we supported those Marines as he went up into Iraq for three months uh, while they pushed the Iraqis back. We got home six months later, and my three years on board that ship didn't go much differently as far as unpredictability and mission tasking. Fast forward to the end of my tour on board Bataan, incredible tour, incredible experience, but we found ourselves on our way home from doing an exercise with our Latin American allies off of the Panama Canal. And we pulled in to uh, Ingleside, which is right by Corpus Christi, to drop off uh, some helicopters and some, some gear that we've been using in the exercise. We wanted to get home. It was right before Labor Day. We wanted to get home because we've been at sea a lot. I wanted to get folks home to their families before the kids started school and all that good stuff. Um, and they deserved it. So we're pulling out of uh, uh, the channel back into the Gulf of Mexico. I'm sitting on the bridge and we're, you know, going to sea. And my boss called and he goes, hey, Nora, uh, you think you could, like, take the ship a little north, hold for a while, take those helicopters back on board you just dropped off. And as the sea settled down, just kind of make your way over to New Orleans. So you guessed it, Katrina. So Katrina was bearing down, coming through the Gulf of Mexico. We're in an opportune place. So he said, you know, just kind of make your way over. Didn't know what was going to happen. So as you guys know, hurricane passes New Orleans. New Orleans like high-fiving. You know, everything's good. And then the next day, the levee broke and, and all hell broke loose. Anybody in New Orleans then? Well, OK. So at that point, we were off the coast, off the, the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. And, uh, and when we were asked to respond, we jumped in feet first and did whatever we could do. We sent in helicopters. We were plucking people off of roofs. And we were, I mean, you name it, I sent the air traffic controllers in. And they were trying to sector the helicopters that were like mosquitoes flying all over New Orleans. I mean, everybody was trying to do anything they could to help our fellow man. It was surreal. Uh, I flew along the Gulf Coast in a helicopter, and here's these antebellum homes that are just matchsticks. Landed at the Superdome, and there's water everywhere, and there's people you know, walking on the freeway with stuff over their heads. I, I, could, I could write an entire book on that experience. But the bottom line is, throughout that tour, I continually communicated with the crew. I got on our 1MC, which is our public address system on the ship, nearly every day or more often as, as it was called for. And I told them what I knew, and I told them what I didn't know. And I told them about our mission and our tasking, which was changing constantly. And I told them if they weren't ready and they weren't flexible, they were in the wrong business. And I have to tell you, they rose to every occasion, and they answered the call, and they performed superbly. No matter what it was, whether it was combat operations, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief, hosting dignitaries from around the world, it didn't matter. They knew what was expected of them, and they gave it their all. As their leader, as their commanding officer, I learned it was about honesty, it was about sincerity, and it was about empathy and communication, and communication often. It was about walking around the ship as much as I could, all times of the day and night, getting to know the ship's crew, getting to know the Marines that made up that blue-green team, visiting them in their workspaces, on the hangar bay, on the flight deck, in the engineering spaces, building relationships, and building trust. And again, leadership isn't about sitting in a big office, having privileges, and giving orders. It's about solving problems and making the world a better place. It's about inspiring those who will follow in your footsteps 
and it's about those followers wanting to grow up and be you. And it's pretty simple. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to learn this. The military is no different when it comes to leadership and how officers become captains of ships or commanders of fleets or even advisors to the highest levels of leadership in our government. And for us, it's not just about the senior officers displaying the leadership we need. It's about our chiefs leading our young enlisted personnel on the deck plates. It's about our junior officers, again, who we give an extraordinary amount of responsibility at a very young age. And if you look around our Navy, and I would venture to say our military, you'll quickly realize that who we give responsibility to and expect leadership from is never based on gender or ethnicity or where you went to school. And that's when I talk about women's leadership, I realize quickly that today, I'm really just talking quite simply about leadership. And as you may know, our military has opened virtually every occupation to anyone who meets the requirements. You notice I didn't say to women because as we all know, there are many people who don't meet the requirements, both male and female for any number of reasons. So that's why it's critical that we make the effort, and this is, not a, this is the hard part, to understand what is required to do specific tasks, physically, mentally, emotionally, and if we don't make the effort to do that and understand what exactly is required to do a job, then we may be forfeiting that opportunity to have the best person in the job and ultimately, if we put the wrong person in the job for the wrong reason, we may be sacrificing the mission and lives. So the way I see it, when a woman is the best qualified candidate, she should get the job. When she isn't the best qualified, she shouldn't. But I think in the military, gone are the days where the female service members will never know if they had qualified for the job. The American people trust the Navy and the military to carry out incredibly important missions. Those missions have to be accomplished by our best qualified and our most capable service members. And whether that service member looks like me or looks like anybody in this room, that's irrelevant. Leadership isn't defined by how we look, it's defined by our thoughts and by our actions. And in any occupation, it's our diversity of thought, built from our different backgrounds and our different experiences, which allow us to view those challenges from new angles and find new solutions. And I am thrilled that we have recognized that we're a better Navy, and in my mind, a better world, because our differences can make us stronger. And I'm thrilled that groups like this one gathered here today recognize how important leadership is in our world today. So again, Mark, thank you so much for inviting me to join you, and, and thank you for being leaders in everything that you do. So I, I don't know where I am time-wise, but if we got time for questions, it, it's an honor to be here. Thank you.